You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Week-long violent protests by TLP push Pakistani establishment to the edge. United States fears terror groups in Afghanistan could carry out attacks in the West. And Pak-backed terrorists aggravate efforts to create unrest in Jammu and Kashmir. Let's begin the show with Pakistan, where Islamic fundamentalists belonging to various jihadi outfits are now the real rulers and lawmakers. They can control the state machinery from the streets. The ongoing violent protest by proscribed Tehreek e Labbaik Pakistan once again exposed that such radical groups hold a great sway in the rapidly growing hardline society of Pakistan. And by negotiating with them and accepting their demands, Prime Minister Imran Khan-led government in Islamabad has surrendered before an extremist outfit that has railed against blasphemy and employed it as its main talking point. A report. Pakistan's army and its puppet government, which is expert in taking pseudo-actions against terrorist and extremist groups residing in the country, while in reality supporting the terror and violence, once again stands exposed to the whole world. The Imran Khan-led government recently released 350 members of a so-called anti-blasphemy party, tehreek e labbaik Pakistan, whose thousands of supporters were blatantly wreaking havoc on streets, killing four police personnel and wounding at least 263. According to Pakistan's interior minister, this was done as per the decision with the TLP. Later, Prime Minister Imran Khan-led government announced that TLP will no longer be treated as a political party, but as a militant group. However, analysts term such actions as a sham to save face in front of the international community, especially for a country that failed to get off the Financial Action Task Force's grey list for the fourth time. Baloch, Sindhis, Muhajirs, all these are killed, kidnapped, and uh, there is a missing person list of thousands of people. But uh, here they are negotiating with this terrorist who are firing uh, through uh, AK-47 straight to Pakistan army and security forces. Uh, not army, they, they are firing to police because they have not killed any rangers or uh, army personnel. They are killing the police which is uh, civil administration and under Imran Khan. So it is understandable that it is on the instructions of General Bajwa that they are on the streets. It is not for any demand. And I'm telling you that they will go back as soon as Bajwa tells them without any demand being ex accepted. The TLP, an extremist group founded by firebrand Muslim leader Khadim Hussein Rizvi, who died in November 2020, has made the issue of perceived blasphemy its rallying cry. Banned under the anti-terrorism legislation, the radical group has been protesting against the detention of its leader, Saad Hussain Rizvi, who was detained by Pakistan government in April this year. Following the party's violent protests against a series of caricatures of profit published in the French satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo, they have also been demanding the expulsion of the French ambassador from Pakistan and severing all ties with France. Last week, the TLP had given a two-day deadline to the government to meet its demands or face a sit-in in the capital. As per several reports, this issue goes beyond the TLP's demand to release its chief Saad Rizvi or to expel the French ambassador. Some experts say that there is a rift between the civilian government 
and the military, and the military wants to create more pressure on Imran Khan's government through such groups. Like several other terror outfits, TLP was also maneuvered into mainstream politics by the country's army brass as one of its tools of political engineering. TLP had its big show in 2017 when it carried out a violent anti-government protest over allegations of blasphemy. It is no secret that it had the backing of the ISI and the aim was to destabilize and humiliate the Nawaz Sharif's PMLN government of the time. Later, a video of an army general handing out cash rewards to TLP protesters also surfaced on social media, clearly implicating the army's role in this dirty saga. We have seen recently that the Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan was trying hard to uh, reassign the Faiz Amid for the ISI uh, chief, but they, the military wanted General Nadim Anjum to bec become the chief of the inter-service intelligence. And I think that's one of the reasons what we are seeing now in shape of the protest, to show the civilian government that they are nothing, but the army has the power and they can do anything and everything to show them or to teach them a lesson. And we have seen this in the past as well in Nawaz Sharif's government. Meanwhile, the civilian government in Pakistan is also engaged in a cycle of appeasement politics. Having pandered to the religious groups in the past, the Pakistan government is now paying the price for encouraging these fringe elements. The government is fearful of chaos on the streets and the street power of the mullah. Pakistan has entered an era in which religious hardliners have more power to dictate their decisions from what is Islamic to what is not and who is an infidel, a blasphemer, a sinner and a Western agent. The Taliban in Afghanistan is under significant international pressure to deny safe haven for transnational terrorist groups. But its position towards handling of these outfits remains unclear. Emboldened by the Taliban's success, many dreaded terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and Haqqani Network are likely to re-establish their presence in Afghanistan. U.S. intelligence community now believes that terrorist groups like Islamic State Kharasan and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan could launch attacks in the West too. Take a look. With the Taliban having taken control of Afghanistan, the future of the terrorism landscape of the country depends on its anti-terrorism policies. The Islamist group leadership publicly insists that they will not allow Afghan territory to be used as a safe haven for terrorists plotting against other countries. But they do not clarify why they were not able to uphold such a commitment before 9-11. The group also offer little clarity on their current relationships with various jihadi groups. The Taliban have made no public demonstration that they have acted on commitments to prevent their membership from interacting with Al-Qaeda figures. Meanwhile, a senior Pentagon official raised concern that the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda could have the ability to attack the United States in the near future. I think the intelligence community currently assesses that both ISIS-K and Al-Qaeda have the intent to conduct external operations, mm -hmm. including against the United States, uh, but neither currently has the capability to do so. We could see ISIS-K generate that capability in somewhere between six or 12 months. Uh, I think the current assessments by the intelligence community is that Al-Qaeda uh, would take a year or two to reconstitute that capability. The withdrawal of U.S.-led NATO troops and the Taliban's takeover of Kabul are iconic milestones for Islamist outfits. The recent developments in Afghanistan have bolstered their morale and strength substantially. Additionally, factors like inter-militant competition and Pakistani state policies are likely to further aggravate the threat. In such circumstances, U.S. intelligence agencies are again noticing activities of the terrorist group once led by Osama bin Laden. 
it's very curious that the Americans have come up with this assessment because it was the same assessment for the last 20 years. If you can't crack down on the fountainhead of terror, which is Pakistan, then you knew there was no chance of, you know, eliminating terror in Afghanistan. And the moment the Americans get out, it was going to become another, you know, uh, kind of Switzerland of terror where anybody can come and set up a terror camp and get, uh, you know, benefits and things like that for it. Uh, so, you know, it's only a matter of time before you see another major international attack come out of Afghanistan. And for me, what is particularly remarkable is that the Americans are coming out with this when it was the same reason for the last 20, 21 years now. U.S. officials are working on ways to continue intelligence work without a troop presence or an embassy in the country. Lawmakers, counter-terrorism experts and former intelligence officials have expressed concern over how reliable so-called over-the-horizon capabilities can be without networks of informants to guide them. To effectively reposture, the United States and its allies are expected to use diplomacy and economic incentives to gain basing rights in the region that will enable intelligence collection. Defense and intelligence community leaders should then allocate resources to address the emerging risk. America believes it can deal with this challenge purely by drones and human intelligence. But we need to remember how badly corroded that human intelligence was, that it ended up killing more, many times more civilians than it did terrorists. So if they think they are going to control Al-Qaeda by drones, based on flawed human intel, most of whom are in the Pakistani ISI's pockets. Uh, it, it clearly means that they've learned nothing from their 20 years out there. They're still falling into the same, you know, uh, traps of being gullible and even more gullible day by day. Taliban have never broken ties with Al-Qaeda, despite significant pressure to do so, not because they are slow on the uptake, but because their relationship to the terrorist group offers meaningful benefits. As they navigate a highly complex political environment in Afghanistan and Pakistan, they are not willing to break this partnership. The Islamist group is unlikely to honor its counter-terrorism agreements in the Doha deal. Meanwhile, women in Afghanistan too are bearing the brunt of the crisis as the Taliban so far has failed to live up to its promises of offering a more moderate and inclusive style of leadership. The group has not fulfilled the commitments regarding the education of girls, women's rights and an all-inclusive government. Afghan women especially are afraid of their future and they are staging protests and demanding their voices to be heard. Our report. The Taliban, after the fall of Kabul, vowed to form a moderate and inclusive government which would respect women's rights and provide stability in the region. But the reality in Afghanistan is far different from the commitments the insurgent group initially made. Across Afghanistan, the Taliban seem to have been busy erasing women and girls from all aspects of public life. Even their images on posters and billboards, once common, have been painted over. As their male classmates are going to school, millions of teenage girls across Afghanistan are still anxiously waiting to return to the classrooms. Women are compelled to march through the streets of Afghanistan, demanding their rights to education and work, while urging their voices to be heard by the international community. <laughs> On one hand, Afghan women are demanding their rights to education and on the other hand, those who have already obtained professional success now fear for their lives. Afghanistan has roughly 500 registered women lawyers and about 250 women judges who carried out dangerous work even before the Taliban took power. But many of them are now leaving the country as they fear that they could be tracked down and killed because of their work delivering justice to women. They have good reason to be afraid. In January, two judges of the Afghan Supreme Court were shot dead in Kabul. 
Many of the women legal officials are receiving threats from Taliban and their loved ones are at risk of persecution from the Islamist group. کارمند دولت بودن اینا صد فیصد در خطر هستند همچنان فامیلی ما که اونجا مانده ما تنها چهار نفر خود کشیدیم از اعضای خانواده ما همه در خطر هستند واقعا اونا را خطر تهدید میکنه نگرانشان هستیم ما درسته که اینجا آرام هستیم ولی روحا ما نارام هستیم چون همکارای ما فامیلی ما در اونجا در خطر Women are a major part of the force of community health workers in Afghanistan, but fearing violence and Taliban retaliation, many have left the country. Afghanistan's hospitals are grappling with the fallout of a rapidly spreading economic crisis that has threatened millions with hunger. And for the medical team, it is the acute staff shortage that is causing the heaviest strain. In Kabul's main children hospital, the crumbling of Afghanistan's health system can be seen in the eyes of the exhausted staff who have remained in the city. Nurses who once took care of three to four babies each are now having to look after 20 or more. Millions of lives in Afghanistan depend on how the Taliban government chooses to rule the country. But the Islamist group, as per current behavior, doesn't deserve legitimacy. Therefore, humanitarian aid to it should be given in kind and not in cash, which is unlikely to reach the needy people. Taliban needs to be given a hard choice either to accept the terms on women's rights or manage the crisis. The insurgent group doesn't accept the terms, the converse could be disastrous as it is not a popular regime. A humanitarian crisis could soon turn into a fresh wave of violence against the regime. Let's now talk about India's Jammu and Kashmir, which has been continuously witnessing violence owing to the malicious agendas of Pakistan-backed terrorists. Islamabad has been relentless in its efforts in exporting terrorists into the Kashmir Valley to create mayhem by targeting security forces and the civilians. Security experts now call for a strict action against the perpetrators for maintaining regional peace and stability. Instability in Kashmir is Pakistan's main agenda as it suits its plan to draw international attention. Pakistan is providing training and funding the terrorists to infiltrate into Jammu and Kashmir and carry out attacks on security forces and civilians. It creates fear psychosis among the locals and sends a message internationally that Kashmir is not peaceful. This Pakistani propaganda in Kashmir has been going on for decades now. In the past few days, many civilians and security personnel in Jammu and Kashmir have lost their lives in terror attacks. At least six civilians were injured and one was killed in a grenade attack in Bandipura. Earlier, two policemen and an army soldier were injured in a gun battle between security forces and terrorists in the Poonch area. See, you know that our Western adversary is indulging in a proxy war against us. And you know what are the dynamics of a proxy war. So they will do anything that will disturb the peace and tranquility in, in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So whenever they find that there is semblance of peace happening there, they will create a situation that creates fear-mongering amongst the people. These are, you know, short game things that the uh, adversary is playing and we should not fall prey to their propaganda and the kind of activities there. In fact, we should be shunning these activities. Jammu and Kashmir has witnessed a rapid development after the abrogation of Article 370 to end its special status. There was also a decline in terror-related incidents and cross-border infiltration. 
However, in the past few days, there has been a spate of incidents when terrorists have targeted many civilians, especially from the minority Hindu and Sikh communities. This has been part of Pakistan's new strategy to revive terrorism in the Union territory. Most of the recent terror attacks have been claimed by the Resistance Front and the People's Anti-Fascist Front belonging to Pakistan-backed lashkar e taiba The emergence of such kind of outfits is to ensure the links of any big terror attack do not go back to Pakistan or at least to the designated outfits. Experts believe that Pakistan will not amend its malicious strategies unless it is blacklisted by the Financial Action Task Force. The time has now come that there has to be a concrete action plan to ensure that terrorism per se is removed from the originators of terror. And the originators of terror are Pakistan and uh, China. Until unless United Nations names Pakistan as a terrorist town, puts uh, Pakistan in blacklist in FATF, until unless economic sanctions are imposed on Pakistan, things are not going to approve. Thousands of Kashmiris have lost their lives in a proxy war orchestrated by Pakistan and they continue to suffer due to terrorist groups supported by the Pakistani army and spy agency, the ISI. There are several terror camps operating in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir who infiltrate into India with the help of Pakistan army. The ceasefire violations at line of control by the Pakistan army provide enough cover to these terrorists to creep into Jammu and Kashmir. In recent months, Indian security forces have unearthed several tunnels at the international border in the Jammu region, excavated by the terrorists with the help of Pakistan army. It not only exposed Pakistan's malicious designs of cross-border infiltration, but supply of arms and ammunition into India. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at nin.com. This is Shreya Sabajay signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.